What you actually want is a better pulse on what do people and small businesses actually want, and then you want to serve supply to meet that demand. Mm. And that means that things like new industries can crop up. So on Airtasker, we get people um, saying, you know, remove a spider from my kitchen, um, you know, make a Halloween costume, write a poem for my wife's anniversary, you know, all of these kinds of things. <laughs> you would not want to get busted outsourcing that. <laughs> I'd be like, I wrote it, it's mine. <laughs> get really used to rejection. I know a lot of people say that, but I think even if you have the red hottest, greatest product ever, you will be lucky to bag one in 10 investors. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I think there's been a lot of talk around, you know, failure is awesome and all that. And like, yeah, I don't think you need to go that far, but I definitely <laughs> Too think- Too much failure. <laughs> yeah, like, I think you gotta create an environment where everything is an experiment, you can put it out there, and you can find out if it's good or it's bad. Hi everyone, welcome to today's episode of the Make It Happen Show. Today, we're joined by Tim Fung, co-founder and CEO of what is regarded as one of the most successful startups in Australia, Airtasker. Airtasker is a community marketplace platform that connects people who need tasks done with people who have the skills to complete them. Tim came up with the idea of the startup when he was moving house and asked to borrow his friend's delivery truck. It was actually a chicken delivery truck and his friend said, you're the fourth person that's needed to borrow it this month. And so the idea was born from there. In less than seven years, Airtasker has disrupted the Australian workforce amassed more than 2.5 million members who post over 37,000 tasks a week on the platform. That includes anything from normal domestic services and chores to removalist jobs, pet grooming, and some other weird and wonderful requests. In 2018, Airtasker went global and launched in London. It's supported now by a global team of 150 people. Tim's been a fixture in the Aussie startup and entrepreneurial world for some time now. He's also the co-founder and director of Tankstream Labs, a Sydney-based tech co-working space, and the founder of Circuit Club, a community for motorsport enthusiasts, which he started when he was still at uni. Tim's journey as an entrepreneur is really inspirational and I really enjoyed this conversation with him. We talked about the, the early days of Airtasker, the different stages of growth that he's gone through, some of the mistakes that he made along the way, which is really valuable lessons. Uh, we also discovered our shared passion around cars and racetracks and even managed to bring that back to business. Uh, and it, really importantly, we talked about who Tim has brought onto his team and when to really facilitate the growth of Airtasker. So I really enjoyed this conversation. We covered a lot of fantastic ground. Here it is, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Make It Happen Show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Make It Happen Show. We're here with Tim Fung from Airtasker. Airtasker is one of the great success stories in the Australian startup and now will growth business scene. So fantastic to have you here, Tim. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm going to dive into all sorts of areas of Airtasker, the journey, anything you want to share with us. Uh, but first of all, you've recently done a really big partnership with IKEA. Right, so how did you make that happen? So it actually came about because we got in touch with the managing director um, of IKEA and he came around to our office and we did a presentation for him and we showed him that we'd done 35,000 um, IKEA jobs in the, in the prior 12 months. 12 and, months? Yeah, and he had kind of compared it to his, um, to his own um, services business and he was going, oh my God, IKEA, uh, Airtask is doing way more IKEA jobs than IKEA is doing. Um, and so I guess um, it was definitely kind of driven by consumers wanting um, a service um, and so IKEA adopting that. And so for you, it was going in with the data showing like, hey, there's this demand already here, we better partner up. Yeah. yeah, and that's pretty much the story of Airtasker in general, which is that the services economy, it's not really mapped. Like mm -hmm. no one is really tracking what's going on. It's a very fragmented sort of industry. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what Airtasker is doing is, I guess, bringing that into a marketplace, which makes it more trustworthy, um, safer, and, you know, of course, something that can be optimized over time. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was, actually, there was a really great article by Andrew Chen, who uh, you're a fan of growth hacking and, and growth, and I'm sure you'd be a big, big fan of his as well, talking about the evolution of uh, service marketplaces and how it really is getting into the sort of the next stage of evolution. Definitely. I mean, if you kind of think about how people were, were doing services, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, um, there's local notice boards, there were things like the yellow pages, and they mm -hmm. were pretty much adopting like a, an advertising model, which is that suppliers would pay to put up the you know the biggest ad possible mm -hmm. and then people if they were searching for a service they'd go there and you know that's kind of evolved over time into things like classifieds which are a little bit um, you know closer to the problem um, into marketplaces mm -hmm. and the on-demand economy yeah uh, which is a little bit closer again and I think we're going into the next era now we're going to see some 
uh, really interesting stuff go down. Yeah. So what is at the forefront, do you think, of services or marketplaces, but particularly like marketplaces for services? Like where do you think, where do you see it going? Well, overarchingly, I think that uh, people do want a marketplace. So mm-hmm. they, um, there was a lot of stuff that was going on about on-demand services, which was, you know, kind of press a button mm-hmm. and it's all packaged up and commoditized in exactly one way and it just, and mm-hmm. it just happens. And I think when you, um, when you look at um, that model, it's got some very limited categories which it works well for. Mm-hmm. So it works well for like food delivery, which yeah. is like heavily commoditized. Yeah. It's worked well for um, transport, obviously, with Uber. Um, but that model doesn't really extend um, into all of the other verticals in the same way. Mm. Why? Because services aren't inherently commoditizable. Yeah. Um, definitely, we want to bring some standardization to the market. Um, so it's a little too fragmented now, a little bit too kind of sketchy for a customer to enter that market now. Um, but I don't think that it's going to go to the on-demand version of that. I mm. think it's going to stay in that standardization marketplace formula. Yeah. Yeah, well, because every... every version of a service has to be slightly different. I mean, that's what a service is, right? It's yes. come and meet my need, my specific needs or my specific job, and therefore there's going to be variability in there. Yeah, for sure. I think, and, and, and people come into a service transaction um, wanting something different every time. So mm-hmm. when you kind of think about how people think about transport, I do think that they think about it as, I just need to get A to B, what's the best price, and make it happen quickly. And that's why Uber works fantastically well. Mm-hmm. Um, that product would not fit something like a graphic designer, mm. where you're thinking about, who is this graphic designer? Can I see some work that they've done before? Um, you know, uh, What's their price relative to other um, graphic designers? So mm. there's a very different kind of mindset that you would enter depending on what kind of service you're buying. Yeah. Um, and I think the on-demand model fits only a very slim uh, sliver of the services economy. Yeah, fantastic. And so you've come a long way in the last six years. So, so you're now at the point where you're expanding overseas. Uh, you're obviously a household name here in Australia. So a lot of progress in a short period of time. Cool. Um, <laughs> but going back a couple of years ago, like how did it all start? And then I'm particularly interested in what are the kind of key milestones in your mind of the business getting to where it is today? Yeah, so we started back in 2012. Um, the thesis for the business was around moving apartments. So mm-hmm. I, I was moving apartments. I asked a friend to come and help me move. Um, because he, he has a truck that he uses to do um, deliveries of, of, of frozen chicken products. Yeah. But he has a truck for his small business. I thought, you know, um, I want to use that truck to, to help me move. Um, he did all of this stuff with me, and then that was fine. But, you know, at the end of the weekend, we started talking about, like, you know, why do we ask friends and family to do all of these kinds of jobs for us when, you know, we've got this huge amount of unemployment and even bigger bracket of underemployment mm-hmm. in Australia. Mm-hmm. So that's telling you, people want to do stuff to earn money Yet you ask people who don't want to do those things, and you know <laughs> and you're, you're not, not going to pay money. anyway. <laughs> exactly, right? Other than beer and dinner or something. Um, so yeah, we thought like, why is this? Why is this not happening? And and what we kind of realised is the cost of search is too high. Mm. Like when you want someone to come into your house and do something with you, you need a certain level of trust. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to have them vetted in some sort of way. But your choice was kind of going through the same processes people go through for employment. You know, interview them, police check them, mm. uh, all of this stuff on your own. And it's never going to be worth it for like a $100 job. Yeah. So we thought if you could make a system which kind of had that ingrained, that trust ingrained in it at its core, you'd be able to open up a whole lot of local commerce opportunities. Mm. And so um, that's where the thesis for Airtasker was. And, and we kind of you know, expanded on this concept and we started it out as a as an open marketplace, you know, where people built up their own trust mm-hmm. rather than us trying to tell you this person's good, this person's not good. Mm. We said that should be crowdsourced mm-hmm. um, effectively. And we built it as um, an open marketplace where you could do like lots of different stuff through mm. that marketplace mm-hmm. rather than just picking one vertical. So you didn't decide on what kinds of jobs would be on there. You're like, hey, we'll let the market decide that and we'll just help facilitate it. And For sure. I mean, one of the differentiated advantages of the model that we're in is that it's not supply driven. So mm. like supply driven markets are markets where People have to go and study for seven years in university, do all of these courses, earn you know thirty grand a year as an apprentice before they can finally get up to this level, you know, where they can you know monetize um, mm. the the effort that they've put in. Um, but supply driven marketplaces are quite inefficient because seven years ago we didn't even have Snapchat. Now there's a job, Snapchat marketer. <laughs> you know, uh, we didn't have. Um, you know, the same level of software engineering, you know, seven years ago. So all of these things, like, they change over time. And so what you actually want is a better pulse on what do people and small businesses actually want, and then you want to serve supply to meet that demand. Mm. 
And that means that things like new industries can crop up. So on Airtasker, we get people um, saying, you know, remove a spider from my kitchen, um, you know, make a Halloween costume, write a poem for my wife's anniversary, you know, all of these kinds of things. <laughs> you would not want to get busted outsourcing that. <laughs> I'd be like, I wrote it, it's mine. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Airtasker is a public platform, so they probably can search and find it um, eventually. But um, I think that the, the idea that people can create their own industries really is what is going to fuel, um, you know, the future of work. Mm. Actually, I was going to ask, what is the keys to a successful marketplace? Because a lot of people, when they uh, come up with ideas for a new business, you know, marketplaces are a central tenant of those these days. And I was going to ask, what are some of the key success factors? And I think you've just touched on one of them there, like go for a demand-driven marketplace rather than a supply-driven marketplace. Is that correct? Uh, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the only way you can go about doing yeah. it. And actually... Yeah, depending on which sort of like um, growth strategies you go for, sometimes having lots of supply is good. Yeah. Um, because su like suppliers are kind of um, incentivized to, to grow the market because mm -hmm. there's a very clear incentive, which is make money. money. Yep. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a, a core tenant of all marketplaces, um, but it is how Airtasker chose to grow. Um, I would say, yeah, there, there's a lot of things that go into building a good marketplace. and. And that is why I think marketplace companies are quite valuable because there is no silver bullet. This mm. is what you need to build. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you need a SaaS product. It might just be ask your customers what they want, deliver them exactly what they want, mm -hmm. scale up a sales force. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in marketplaces, it's not that simple. There's the dynamics. It's, it's a much broader set of stakeholders. Mm. Um, and, and the case of like a marketplace like Airtasker, we don't even control our taskers. You know, we can't tell them what to do by mm. definition, you mm. know, because they're not employees of ours. They're just, they're people who use our platform to find work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely challenging because when you release a feature, you've got to think, how will one side of the marketplace, you know, take to that feature? Mm. And then what are the ramifications of that for everybody else in the marketplace too? So. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, you've automatically got multiple sets of customers yes. who have got different demands. Yes. And then you've got how they interact with each other. Yes. And yeah, I can see this little change over here might have all these unintended consequences. Well, sometimes over I, here. I, I just wish we made shoes or something, you know, where <laughs> we could kind of be like, what would be the most awesome shoe? And then make that shoe. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, we're more in a business of, you know, um, yeah. It's not shoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but then you say that's where the value is in the business, right? You, you, you've figured out how to make this, this marketplace, this ecosystem work, which for other people is very difficult to do. So that there's a, an element of protection there for yourselves. You, you've figured out how to do something that other people can't do as easily. Well, there certainly is some defensibility mm. um, in the model, I guess, built in. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a moat made of sweat. <laughs> <You know? laughs> a, a sweat moat. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of gross. <laughs> um, maybe don't take that analogy any further. But um, definitely, I think it is hard to build it up from scratch. Yeah. But equally, at each level you go to, there is no kind of like critical mass where you go, great, we've done our effort, that's all done, it'll mm. just keep growing. Uh, I imagine just like in building a social network or building anything, you need consistent product evolution and mm -hmm. consistent evolution of everything that you do. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there is some defensibility in it, but the job never gets easy, that's for sure. Yeah. And so thinking about o over the first couple of years, let's talk about the first year or two, um, were there any particular periods of growth where you're like, right, we know this is our real focus right now. Like to get started, obviously there's platform development, so the technology development, but then the first stage of growth, what were you really focused on there? Yeah, I would say um, in the early stage, I um, can probably talk about one that didn't work yeah, um, well for us, which was um, we started a thing called Airtasker for Business. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we started Airtasker for Business is that we saw that the, the, the biggest constraint on growth was people not knowing how to like post a task. Mm -hmm. Like that effort was too much for them or they were like concerned about it or lacked confidence to go do it. So we thought, how do we accelerate that? Mm -hmm. One solution we had was go to people who have like lots of tasks take those tasks off them and post them ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we went around and, and, and did this. And, and one of the great examples was real estate agents who wanted letterbox deliveries done. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. went to real estate agents. We'd say, give us your 50,000 flyers and then we'll post all of these tasks on Airtasks and get people to do them. So for a few months there, I was Tim, the letterbox, the distribution guy, certainly wasn't concerned about software. I was concerned more about, are our flyers getting dumped into bins? Yeah. Or are they, you know, being, are they actually being distributed, et cetera? 
Um, and that was something that I think, you know, it's hard to say if it was a mistake or not. It did mm -hmm. get us some extra liquidity, mm -hmm. but, you know, we realized after about six months, like, this is just not going to scale. And it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not where we think that we're putting in our best effort. And so we actually deprecated that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a growth hack that didn't work. I think um, what did work is, is probably having a balance of short-term and long-term projects going at the same time. Mm -hmm. So for us, by the way, long-term is probably six months at that <laughs> stage. But um, you know, we had some longer-term things going on, like getting emails right, mm -hmm. like lifecycle emails. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So put some effort into that. But at the same time, had people out there doing Google ad strategy, you know, yep. which would kind of be like tomorrow yeah, as yeah. a result. Bringing business in tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. And so uh, one year in, how many people were in the team? What, what size business was it around then? So we were, you know, um, about seven or eight people mm -hmm. um, a year in. Um, so we thought that was massive at the time. And I remember <laughs> looking at the P&L and you look at how much money you're spending and you have like a little freak out moment when you kind of pass a new milestone of yeah. how much money you're going, going to spend. And, um, you know, I guess that's a good thing and a bad thing about um, doing a marketplace. It's kind of akin to building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You have to spend a lot of money up front. Mm -hmm. Like you can't kind of sell one unit, make that unit profitable, move mm -hmm. on to the next one. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a social network. You yeah. need all that growth to happen like early so that you have something yeah. and it can be more efficient. Um, so a year in, um, burning lots of money, um, seven or eight people um, in the team. We had all development in-house. Um, so in wow. terms of people doing marketing or anything like that, it was very, very slim. Um, and yeah, every day was hard. Yeah. Yeah, really hard. We well, pushed through, obviously, though. So, so that's sort of year one. And then by year, end of year two, how, what kind of growth did you experience then? Well, at year two, uh, by the end of that period, we'd pretty much uh, burned through all the money that we'd raised um, at the beginning. So it was kind of an existential capital raising process um, was undertaken. Yeah. Um, you know, we knew that, that was going to be the case, but it was, you know, we were cutting it pretty fine. Um, and so that's, that's when all the incentive happens. Oh like yeah, we have to do it you now. Work, you work really hard. I, <laughs> I actually, um, I actually um, was on leave, and I'd taken. Um, uh, and I think we're going to talk about it later. Um, a trip here for one of my other businesses, yeah. um, uh, doing motorsport stuff. Yeah. And so I actually remember being at Spa Francorchamps, which is oh, wow. um, yeah. a yeah. Belgian racetrack. But uh, whilst the other guys were driving, I was like doing contracts with VCs. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was a <laughs> so you're, time. while you're off indulging in motorsport, which is pretty much burning money at the best of times, <laughs> you're then worrying about burning money at home and coming and getting some more in there. Well, we can talk a little <laughs> bit about Circuit Club, but Circuit Club is the way that I actually have uh, managed to be able to do motorsport without having to pay for it by uh, having a business around it. Yeah, so, well, yeah. I've often thought, yeah. well, actually, let's talk about Circuit Club. Yeah. It's a really great place, place to talk about that. So uh, what is Circuit Club? So um, during university, I, um, I liked hotted up uh, cars. I, um, I had a Honda Integra Type R, 1990 mo 1999 model, yeah. loved this car since I was a teenager, just always wanted this car and I saved some money up, bought this car and we loved driving them fast. Um, realized um, through some pretty stupid activities um, that the racetrack is definitely the best place to be, um, to be uh, racing cars. Yep. And so um, we, we <laughs> organized a, a day to go to the racetrack and we realized we couldn't afford it. Like, um, so we, um, we actually pulled all of our money together, me and uh, my friends Daniel, Ivan and Narada, pull all of our money in together and we said, we're gonna book out the racetrack for the whole day. And so we put together a few thousand dollars, did that and we said, if we invite 30 people, we'll break even mm -hmm. and we won't have to pay for our own track day. And so um, we managed to get um, 29 people plus a bunch of passengers. And I think we lost $50 on our first um, truck day. That is, that's um, pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah. So we're pretty, pretty stoked with that. And since then, we've been doing that like once a month or once every six weeks. Um, yeah. Go to the racetrack and, you know, it's a lot of effort um, uh, that we put into the business. So we don't pay ourselves or anything like that. But it's a way to be able to do what we love doing without paying too much money. I say I've always thought when you have expensive hobbies of which cars is definitely one of them figure out how to run a business around it even if the business that's doesn't right. make any money at yes. least you're not you're not spending everything yes, on it that's right yeah well i think it's a really interesting area so i've got an old race car i've got a 1985 e30 bmw that, I, that I race in a series for that and, and i think it started very similarly to you like i just started wanting to go to the track and i had an old road car and gradually kind of got into it a little bit more and i think it's a great sport i think it's absolutely fantastic because yeah. you're trying to it's intense concentration in amongst all this chaos. Yes. Um, and I actually kind of liken it to running a business 
Uh, because as you know, um, when you're, so racing's all about cornering. Right, so the, the speed, so going down the straight is actually really where you relax, right? Even though the car is going the fastest, it's all about how you go through the corner, and it's all about going through the corner at the limit of traction. Right, so you're actually sliding around the corner, and if you're sliding just a little bit, that's as fast as you get around the track. And I'm like, that's a lot like running a business, right? It's about the curves. So when stuff happens that you're not expecting, it's about getting through that. Um, right on the limit of traction. Like you're just about to spin off, but you somehow make it all the way through and then carry the speed through the next stage of growth. So well, just make sure you just don't flame out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, really yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you go too hard and too fast, but again, like running a business, right? If you go too hard, you, you're going to come off. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I reckon they're very, very similar. Yes. Um, I mean, we use the analogy at, at Airtasker of, um, you know, of Formula One, mm -hmm. which is really about, you know, um, doing things at, the, at that top level of, of, of motorsport. Mm -hmm. um, and I think not a, a lot of that analogy plays true. Of course, not all of it. You know, yep. sports got some analogy to business, but, but not completely. Yep. Um, but yeah, we definitely use motorsports as, a, um, yeah, as our analogy. Good thing. analogy. Yeah, particularly that, top, I mean, that real pinnacle. It's like, how do, we, how do we be the best, be constantly advancing? Yeah. yeah. We actually had a Formula One uh, engineer uh, come in and do a talk at Airtasker about his experience. He um, he ran Alonso Fernando Alonso during um, during his championship winning days at Renault, and he was telling us some really interesting stories. You know, although they had you know a team of a thousand people um, going out, they had a whole team of people who just tested stuff on the side. Mm. Um, but they actually had um, some geniuses in the mix too. And one of them was this guy who his genius thing that he could do would be to go to a corner, rub his sneakers um, on the corner yeah. and be able to tell you what the grip coefficient of the corner was. Um, and so I think it's a mix of kind of like this process and optimization mixed in with a bit of brilliance. Of, yeah, yeah. You know, these amazing people. So. <laughs> What a super foul. What yeah. can you do? I can tell the grip coefficient on a corner through my sneakers. Yes, very special sneakers. <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's um, let's go back to what we were talking about, which was raising raising capitals, which where we were there. So um, so you have done a couple of rounds of raising capital, mm. uh, and I mean, what what are your lessons through that process? Are there any key strategies that you would recommend to other business owners going through the process? Well, first of all, I'd say that as the CEO, um, as a founder of a company early on, I guess your number one job is to keep that company resourced and mm -hmm. able to move forward. So um, although, you know, I think most people have a passion for improving the product, getting marketing going, um, hiring great people, all of this stuff. Unfortunately, one of the things that you have to do is make sure that you have the money to be able to do all mm. of those things. Mm. Um, and so in the early stages of running the company, it's definitely a big piece of the, of the puzzle that you have to solve. Um, in terms of tips, I guess um, the first thing I would say is get really used to rejection. I know a lot of people say that, but I think even if you have the red hottest, greatest product ever, you will be lucky to bag one in 10 investors. Okay. Why is that? Everyone has a different mandate. Some people are like, we only do global companies day one. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's, that's struck out. That's not going to work for us. Other people say, you're too small. You know, I, I, I can only invest a million dollars at a time mm. because, you know, I've only got a few people in my team. We can't look at deals that are too small. Um, other people go, oh, you're too big. <laughs> um, I'm too, you know, on the other side of that. And so there's so many reasons why um, people will say no to you. And I think a lot of people can kind of, um, internalize that and get upset about it. And I think mm. one thing you have to be able to do is kiss a lot of frogs, which is, you know, go out there, talk to a lot of people, and have a lot of people not, you know, not buy into what you're, what you're doing yeah. um, and not be offended, um, not be offended by that. Yeah. The other thing is I would say is always know what you want. Mm -hmm. As one thing I've been learning as we've gone um, through the process over time is the job of the founder is to know exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And that, that sounds something that's really easy. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, you say, oh, I'd love to be really rich and I'd love to have a thousand people and all this kind of stuff. But actually sitting down and, and actually figuring out what the steps are, like, what do you want next? Yeah. What does good look like? That takes a lot of effort and it's draining. Yeah, because well, you, you are creating something that doesn't yet exist. Right? Mm. That, and that is that whole strategy piece. It's like, w w what's my vision of the future? Yes. And how do I bring that back into the sort of tangible, sequential steps that other people are going to believe in? Yes. And then getting everyone to come along the journey. It's, like a, it's, a, very, it's a hard process. Oh, I mean, you know, I think that sometimes I love just defaulting to doing something manual, yeah. whether it's folding origami cranes or like making the Christmas boxes. Like I love doing that kind of repetitive manual stuff. But yeah. 
what I think you have to realize as a founder is that when you're doing that, you're actually not doing your main job. Mm -hmm. Your main job is the harder cognitive load job which is knowing what you want and being yeah. able to write it and articulate it. Yeah, 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 translate it so everyone can follow you along. Okay, so um, so now talking about sort of maybe the next couple of years, right, like extreme growth. Uh, I think you're up to about 160 employees or maybe even more at this stage. So, mm. so you've gone from 20 to 160. Uh, what are some of the challenges that have come with that growth? I mean, there's lots and lots of challenges. I would say the biggest mistake that we've made along the way is uh, we took too long to build out a people operations function. Uh So, um, you know, we kind of had a mindset of, oh, if we can have less people in our organization, that's less cost. And so if there's X amount of output and less cost, isn't that awesome? Aren't we doing a great job? So, you know, like that bootstrapping kind Mm -hmm. of mentality. Um, But actually what you realize over time is that every purse is an investment that's going to make you money. Mm. So you should figure out a way of optimizing for that. Mm-hmm. Hire as many people as you can and get them to make as much money for you as yeah. you can, like yeah. or for the company as you can. And so uh, we didn't hire that um, people operations function until we hit about 40 people in the company. And by that stage, you know, we thought we were pretty cool. We, uh, we thought everyone was happy. We issued a customer, enge- uh, an employee um, uh, engagement survey, and we totally bombed it. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay, looks like there's heaps of stuff we're not doing well. Yeah. Um, and so we actually um, then hired someone very senior, a guy named Mahesh, um, to, to come and run um, people operations at Airtasker. And it was actually you know, far above the pay grade that we thought that we were going to be hiring someone for that role. Mm. Um, but when we did that, we, um, we were then able to create processes which allowed us to, um, to completely transform the organization from one which thought about people as you know, extra cost and extra you know, extra stuff that you got to look after mm-hmm. to completely the opposite model where you're like, every person is valuable and they're creating so much value yeah. for us. How do we optimize the hell out of that? And, and an investment in the future growth of the business. For sure. Yeah, like, it, uh, yeah. yeah it goes back to what you were saying before about resourcing. Right? Your, your job is resourcing the business and there's capital and there's people. For sure. Like, I don't think you, you should not think of yourselves as winning if you're like, yeah, I've kept the cost base low. But now we always hit this stage of growth and we've got to scramble to go and, mm-hmm. and fix that. Like winning would be that you're growing the company, you know, in tune with your, your top line growth. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it, a lot of these things are completely counterintuitive. Like a lot of people are told not spending money is a great thing. If you turn it around as you're not spending money, you're investing money into something that yeah. is your company, yeah. then actually completely goes the other way around. Yeah, interesting. And then there was also, so you found a, a head of people operations that was sort of way above what you were originally pitching it at, yes. uh, but obviously made the choice to bring him on. Um, is that an area that you would recommend people to do? Like always bring on higher talent than you were expecting to do? Yeah, I think you definitely want to keep a really high talent bar. I think mm. that is something that, again, is really challenging thing to do. Like sometimes it can feel good to just fill a role or, 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 or um, you know, move faster. But actually, I think that that old adage of, you know, hire slowly and Mm -hmm. hire fast is Mm -hmm. definitely really, really important. I would say that um, both of those things are true. Keep the high bar, Mm -hmm. which means that you're going to slow down your hiring Mm because you're putting friction into that process. You're Mm -hmm. saying you've got to pass this level, this level and this level to get in. It doesn't mean have lots of interviews. Mm -hmm. It just means um, set down criteria, which are really high, and then make sure that that person ticks off all those criteria. Yeah. Um, and then I think, um, unfortunately, it also means firing fast too. So mm-hmm. it means that if people aren't meeting the bar, you have to move them on. And it's the right thing to do by them and the right thing to do by you. Mm-hmm. Um, one way that you can avoid doing that, having to do that too often is by giving much shorter, sharper feedback. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, it sounds easy to be really nice and polite to everyone in the office. I think it's actually better if, you know, you have fun, um, you know, you get excited, you celebrate with people. But I think it's incredibly important that you can um, uh, write down when there's feedback. When you mm-hmm. see something that's not quite at the bar that you think it needs to be, yep. let that person know. And do it in a caring way. Yeah. Um, but, but it's hard work. And it's a lot more cognitively draining than punching out a bunch of emails or doing some manual labor. Yeah, yeah. And so talking about your feedback process, so we, to, how do you encourage people to give that feedback? Is it just on the spot? Cadence of feedback? Do you do quarterly reports, monthly reports? How do you do that? 
Yeah, so I think the, the most important thing is that you, um, that you just have a good um, interpersonal uh, feedback. So mm -hmm. you create an environment which is very trusting, mm -hmm. which means that people can just walk up to somebody else and say, hey, I saw you do that. It wasn't that cool. Mm. Like, here's, here's a better way you could do it. In terms of, like, that actual interaction, I think there's a couple of steps that are super important. Um, one would be giving the person context. So you go, hey, the reason why I want to tell you this is because I care about you generally and mm -hmm. I care about this mm -hmm. company generally. Mm. Second thing would be make sure you've got facts. Like yeah. don't kind of come in and go, oh, well, I think you're crap. You know, I think it's like, <laughs> hey, we did this. It didn't do as well as we thought. Why might that be? Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is like work together on a solution. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we actually do a feedback training at Airtasker. And this is something that I thought would be, you know, I was like, oh, this sounds like a schmozzle. And then I went and did the feedback training and I was like, this was so awesome. Like, like, damn, these are my basic feedback's things. been really bad. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, um, yeah, don't criticize people, but just tell them how they can be better. And, yeah. and I think everyone wants that. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is everyone loves receiving feedback. Mm -hmm. Like most people actually really love it. If somebody says, hey, you know, you kicked the ball, it didn't quite hit the goal, why? Mm. You know, and, and th most people love that. What's actually really hard is being the person who gives the feedback. Mm. No one wants to be the guy who <laughs> appears to be the bad guy yeah. or, or anything. But it's kind of funny because since people love getting it, actually you're doing the best thing for the mm. world by giving it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, people, people need to know. It's not just love. People need to know how they're going. Yeah. Uh, good or bad. Yes. Uh, and, and so feedback's obviously one of the ways to do that. And um, yeah, going in with a mindset that I'm being constructive here, I'm doing the thing that's going to help this person out the most, yes. is, is a good way to do it. Yes. Uh, the other area that, that we're really big on is KPIs. And mm -hmm. everyone having clear KPIs that are visible and they can see how they're tracking against them. Uh, is this an area that you guys put any effort in or a lot of effort into? Yeah, so we, um, we have two main structures that we use for, I guess, um, managing growth in the business. One would be um, OKRs. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, objectives and key results. Yep. Um, we have like a one-year um, statement around what's our objective. So it's kind of like a broader statement. Mm -hmm. um, then we have key results uh, for the next quarter. So you're mm -hmm. looking at um, uh, uh, what what are the actual metrics that I want to hit? What are the deliverables that I want to hit for the next quarter, which moves me in the direction of, of achieving my objective? Mm -hmm. um, so we have that for managing quarterly cadence. And then we have a two-year customer experience vision. Mm. Where we've said, in two years' time, this is what we'd love for the product to do and for um, we'd love for our customers to feel when they use Airtasker. And I think that this, it's different for every company, mm -hmm. but that kind of cadence is good for us because we are building a brand new product. We cannot waterfall what the next year looks like. Mm. We can't say, here's mm. the roadmap mm. for the next year. In March, we're delivering this. In April, we're delivering that. In June, we're delivering this. And that's how much revenue we're going to get mm -hmm. because literally everything that we create, we put it out there and it either succeeds or it fails. And actually failing is not that bad. Mm. Like if you build a product, you, you have a good thesis for building that product and it doesn't quite work out, well, as long as you're kind of ingesting that feedback and building the next one, um, and that one um, starts working, or you know, over a period yeah. of time, you're, you're winning more than you're losing, then, then that's awesome. Yeah, yeah so learning from the things that don't quite work so the next things do work. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I think there's been a lot of talk around you know, failure is awesome and all that. And like, yeah, I don't think you need to go that far, but I definitely <laughs> Too think... Too much failure. <laughs> yeah, like, I think you've got to create an environment where everything is an experiment, you can put it out there, and you can find out if it's good or it's bad. Yep, excellent. And so looking forward now, there's a lot of big things on the horizon for Airtasker. What are some of the um, big milestones you've set yourself? Or uh, You've got a two-year vision, which is amazing. Where do you see yourself in two years? So we're trying to um, really focus on, I guess, the micro interaction with a customer now. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, can happen when you build a platform that's scaling is you start looking at numbers a lot. Mm -hmm. So you start looking at, you know, uh, 40,000 posted tasks a week, millions of dollars of transactions a week. And you stop, you know, that can actually disconnect you from, but what's actually going on with the one-to-one -one customer interaction, mm. how do we make that better? Mm -hmm. So we've actually um, created this customer experience vision where we've said, what does that micro transaction look mm. like? And, mm. and um, we're really following through on that at the moment. Um, the other thing is we're trying to scale that internationally at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we've launched into the UK. Uh, we're seeing double digit thousands of posted tasks a month wow, now. So that's been super exciting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, we're all a bit nervous like, are we actually going to be able to do this or not? Um, turns <laughs> yeah. out we can actually do it, which is good. Um, and we're going to be looking to scale that into um, many, many, many more countries in a much faster pace now. 
Um, so so um, building out, I guess, the organizational structure and the product to be able to handle that growth. Yeah, wow. But with a concentration on the foundation, which is the interaction between your customers and, and sure. the taskers. Talking to the actual humans of Airtasker. And that's yeah. our theme at the moment. It's like the humans of Airtasker go out and do tasks yourself. Mm. Um, go and speak to these guys and find out what makes them tick. Because, yeah, if you zoom out too much and only look at the numbers, you can lose sight of what's actually driving those numbers. Yeah, yeah, and return business and people loving the platform, recommending to everyone else. That's right. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so uh, we're going to start wrapping up now. I've got a couple of questions to ask you that I haven't seen and okay. you certainly haven't seen. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to try and get through these in one minute. Okay. Reckon we can make that happen? Okay. okay. So don't think it through. Don't think it Just through. Just vomit. Short, sharp. I'll try and get the questions right. All right, ready to go? I'm ready. All right. What business idea do you wish you came up with? Ah. Oh. Air tasker? <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> if you could retire tomorrow, what would you do? Uh, Formula One driver. For, <laughs> I get a new job. <laughs> <laughs> well, pause on the clock here. I used to say to my dad, I'm like, Dad, you failed me. Like, I should have been in carts at five, yeah. open wheelers by 14. Yeah, had a million dollar checkbook. At, uh, exactly. You know, it's yeah. just, oh, well. Anyway, so you'll retire in an F1. Great. I'll come and cheer you on. Uh, okay. How do, you, how do you like your eggs? Uh, Boiled. Boiled, excellent, okay. Would you rather sound like Jar Jar Binks for the rest of your life or, or Siri? Uh, Siri, Jar Jar, I would kill myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I reckon someone else would beat you to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Siri's great. <laughs> if you were to post a job on Airtasker, uh, what would you, oh, it says what service would you offer? So I'm gonna ask two questions, actually. If you, would, if you were to post a job, yeah. what would you post as a job? I need tile cleaning at the moment. Okay, great. And if yep. you were to provide a service on there, what service would you provide? I would hang up Christmas lights. Very timely. Well done. <laughs> there must be a lot of demand coming in. <laughs> All right. And finally, uh, Tim, if our listeners have an awesome business idea that they truly believe is going to send waves through their industry, what's the one thing they can do to make it happen? I would say just do something. Um, so. I believe heavily in a bias towards action. Just get out there, build something and find out. Excellent. Fantastic. Wise words from Tim Fung. Thank you very much for coming along. Cool. Really appreciated having you on the show. Thanks and good luck me. with all the future of Airtasker. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Make It Happen show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And it doesn't need to end there. We've actually gone and grabbed a whole bunch of extra resources for you. Behind the scenes footage, videos from this and all the other episodes, as well as show notes that you can grab for free just head along to www.the-entourage.com slash podcast and you can grab all those extra resources. Thanks for tuning in and I cannot wait to introduce you to our next guest on the next episode.